afternoon, Cougar Nation, and welcome to a new edition of the Cougar Tracks podcast on kslsports.com. I'm your BYU insider, Mitch Harper. Cougar Tracks podcast is streaming live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday here on the KSL Sports YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter pages. It's also available in podcast form on all major podcasting platforms. So for the listeners out there listening on the traditional podcast apps, appreciate you and appreciate all of you tuning in on the various live streams. If you're watching on the live streams, feel free to comment during the show, and I can get to some of your questions throughout the program coming up today. Here's the roadmap for today's show, Monday, August 15th. BYU football checks into the preseason AP Top 25 poll. Let's break down the poll a little bit on this show today. You'll hear my conversation with BYU offensive coordinator Aaron Roderick. Coach Roderick on Saturday joined me and Matt Biamonte after Saturday's first scrimmage. I'll break down that first scrimmage, and then, of course, we'll get to Zach Wilson news as the former BYU star quarterback suffered an injury in week one of the preseason. But we start things off with the AP Top 25 poll, and BYU found a way to sneak in. It's It blows me away that BYU is in this spot to where they barely get into the AP Top 25 poll in the preseason. Shocks me. BYU is number 25 in the preseason AP Top 25 poll. First time since 2009 that they are ranked in the preseason rankings. But what blows me away is that BYU has gone back-to-back years, double-digit wins, two different quarterbacks. Last year, the starting quarterback is returning. The entire offensive line except James Empey is back, but the guy that replaced him in the last five or six games, he's back. You add Kingsley Suamata'ia at tackle. The offense is stacked. So much returning production. And even on defense, yes, defensively, they were not great. 71st in total defense, 51st in scoring defense. They returned nearly everyone. And they had some talented transfer portal players like a Gabe Judy Lally. That sort of resume... For any team in a Power 5 conference would be a preseason top 15 team. I would argue that if this same resume going into a season, BYU, if they were in the Big 12 this year, they would be guaranteed to be a preseason top 15 team. But because they're an independent, and honestly, they're out of sight and out of mind for a lot of people, they barely sneak in at 25. Blows me away. It it really goes against everything college football preseason polls is typically based on. Look, if you have conviction behind your ballot, by all means, rank BYU out of the poll. If you truly believe they're not one of the 25 best teams going into the season, don't rank them. That's fine. If you got conviction behind it, that's fine. But I just think most of it's these writers are being lazy. They're not doing their homework. And looking at, oh, BYU's got not only a good quarterback returning, a star quarterback returning. Oh, they lose Tyler Algier. But they replace him with one of the best running backs, offensive players that Cal in the Power Five had. It's amazing, too, to me, that if BYU simply won the UAB game, simply won the Independence Bowl, what's the narrative then? 11-2. and They're probably top 20 at best, or not maybe at at a minimum is what I meant. It just blows me away how they lose that game instantly out of sight and out of mind, and they barely sneak in at 25. Hey, it's better than not being ranked. It, It would be completely egregious if this team wasn't ranked. But at least they're number 25. They should be higher. I would say they they deserve to be a top 15 team. I really believe that just based on history of college football and how these teams get ranked, they're basing it off of last season. What's the knock on BYU last year? You can't say they didn't play anyone. They went undefeated against the Pac-12. 
They beat the Pac-12 champ, who's now number seven in the preseason top 25 poll. Come on. It's insane to me. Here's how the preseason top 25 shakes out in the AP poll. Number one, Alabama, no surprise there. They're going to roll. Uh, roll tide. They are going to breeze through this season. The only time they're going to break a sweat is when they're in the playoff. And might not even break a sweat then. It might not be until the national championship. Number two, Ohio State. Number three, Georgia. Number four, Clemson. Five, Notre Dame. Six, Texas A&M. Seven, Utah. Eight, Michigan. Nine, Oklahoma. And then coming in at number 10, BYU's home opener, the Baylor Bears, week two. Pretty impressive stuff. Oregon in week three, number 11. Oklahoma State, 12. NC State, USC. Michigan State, Miami. Pitt, Wisconsin. Arkansas coming to Provo as well. Kentucky, Ole Miss, Wake Forest, Cincinnati, Houston, and BYU at 25. So BYU has number five, Notre Dame. They got number 10, Baylor, number 11, Oregon, and number 19, Arkansas on the schedule. Pretty impressive stuff. This is a tough, tough schedule that BYU has. And that's why, again, I feel like this year, if you get to 10, holy cow, what an incredible year this would be. Also of note in this poll, the new Big 12 members, Baylor, Oklahoma State, Cincinnati, Houston, and BYU all ranked. Good football is going to be played in this conference. The new Big 12 is going to be outstanding football. It's, it's going to be really good. The highest rated pollster. So here's something interesting. The highest rated pollster for BYU Matt Brown from The Athletic, he had BYU at number 13. Same with Jack Ebling, number 13. I got to give some props where props are due. A guy that BYU fans do not typically care much for, he gave some love, some proper love to BYU. Josh Furlong at KSL.com. He ranked BYU at 15. So there you go. So BYU fans can not downvote Josh Furlong's ballot. He actually gave BYU, I think, a fair ranking, 15. It's amazing all these pollsters that didn't rank BYU. And they're in parts of the country, too, where have you ever actually made the effort to watch BYU football? And then their 25th vote typically goes to someone in their region. It's like, come on, stop with that. Rank the 25 best teams in college football. Let your personal biases go out the door. I know it's tough for people, but you got to check them at the door. It blows me away. It's If BYU would have been in a Power 5 conference this year, they'd probably be where Oklahoma State is. They'd be in the top 15. It's nuts. Anyway, BYU has to prove it on the field. They got room to grow. This is the 12th team since, two, since the history of the program to earn a preseason ranking. Only two times in the previous 11 years has BYU improved on that preseason ranking. That was 2009, where they started at 20, finished 12th. 1981, they finished or started at 19, finished at 12th. So a lot of room to grow for this BYU team. And I think, you know, they probably enjoy that spot. They're coming off their first scrimmage of fall camp over the weekend. and. It was a closed scrimmage. 104 plays took place at the scrimmage at Lavelle Edwards Stadium. The Legacy Cougar Club members were there. Family members of the players and coaches were all there as well. And speaking of the coaches, caught up with BYU OC Aaron Roderick after the scrimmage. And he spoke to myself and Matt Biamonte about what transpired. And here's our conversation with BYU OC Aaron Roderick here on KSL News Radio and Cougar Tracks. I'm going to ask you this question because you've coached him. 
But if you saw Zach Wilson's injury last night, did it make you almost want to bubble wrap your key players going into today's scrimmage? Yeah, we, um, that's kind of what we already did anyway. We, um, we held out some, we held out a few guys and we already had that plan. Uh, before we saw that happen to Zach, we just felt like we have a few guys that it's not that they, you know, don't have things that they can improve upon or get better at, but a few of our guys, we just didn't feel like seeing them get tackled was really going to tell us anything new about them. Aaron Roddick's our guest here on Cougar Sports Saturday for a few more moments. Uh, Coach, uh, we heard your breakdown on Zoom uh, relating to how many plays each quarterback uh, how many snaps each quarterback had. What, what were some notable plays made by Jaron, Jacob, and, and Cade Finnegan from the scrimmage? Jaron um, just did what he always does. He's very efficient, um, steady, takes what the defense gives him. Didn't have any, you know, big flashy moments today, which is it's like, you know, you watch an NFL preseason game, right? It's like, you know, you – you want to see your quarterback just go out there and take care of business. And I thought that's what Jaron did today. Um, and then Conover and Finnegan both had their moments, uh, made some good throws. And then we, we had Sol J and Nick Phillips were live like tackling and, and uh, both of those guys make a lot of plays with their feet. So that was fun to watch them um, make some plays in the passing game where they got to scramble or be on the move. And then, also got him, got him a little bit involved in the run game. That was fun. Coach, with with Jaron Hall uh, in the offense, you, you mentioned earlier in the week that you had had 90% install. That was as of Monday with this offense. Now with another full week under your belt and a scrimmage now, is this thing installed to at 100% now for the season? Pretty close, yeah. I mean, the only thing really left are just some – situational things that you know you, you might need at the end of the game and end, end of the game type plays um you know some some of those very specific situational things we'll get to those this week but yeah we got most of it in early and now now what we're looking for is just we want to our execution to improve with each practice i know you're still looking to uh finalize that offensive line unit and that might take a few more few more practice in a few more weeks. Are there any other position groups or any other things you're just trying to button up as, as we're getting towards the the back half of fall camp? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's battles at every position every day, you know, no, nothing's ever set in stone. And the other thing to consider is, you know, you know, if you're a receiver or a tight end, you're not just competing against the other guys in your group. You're, you're just trying to prove to us that you can help us win a game, you know? And so if we have three receivers that can play, then we'll, we'll play with three receivers. And if we have eight guys that can play, then we'll find a way to play with eight. And same thing goes for tight ends and running backs. And so the more guys that prove to us in practice that they know what they're doing and that they can do something to help us win, then that just gives us more uh, options to create, personnel groups and formations and schemes that utilize what those guys do best. And so that's, that's the approach we're taking every day. It's not just like I'm the sixth receiver and I'm trying to get to fifth and beat out the guy in front of me. It's more like, I'm just trying to prove to the, to the coaches and to the team that I'm reliable. I can do my job and I can help the team win. And then we get, you know, that's where, that's where we get to have fun with, with, um, our rotations and our, our personnel groups. And, and among those personnel groups, coach, who are some maybe first year guys or young underclassmen that have shown you in camp so far that they could be contributor con- contributors to your team if called upon? Um, well, when I answer that question, I, I want to have, you know, have a little bit of caution. I'm not saying that you're necessarily going to see these guys on the field right. in game one. <laughs> um, but the flashes, but, the moments that long term yeah, some guys, some guys that like Ethan Erickson is a, is a guy who's having a good camp. He's a young tight end who has a lot of ability. He's very athletic. He's long, he's tough. Um, and he's behind some really good players, but he's, he's proven to us that he's going to be a good player here. And, you know, I, 
I don't know when his time is going to come. It might be, it might be um, in in the first game. It might be mid season. It might be next year. But he has he's a much improved since last spring, and that's that's just one name that pops into my head that's uh, shown some promise. And um, some of those younger receivers, same thing. You know, the, you see little flashes of those guys. I think, okay, this guy's going to play for us this year. Miles Davis is somebody who. He does something good every day. I mean, he, he just stands out. So, um, you know, when those guys, when their time is going to come, it remains to be seen. But um, they th- those are guys that have shown up in camp that maybe, you know, just your average fan might not know a lot about them yet. Last thing for you, and then we'll let you go. And, and we again, we appreciate the time, Coach Roderick. Uh, how's Isaac Rex doing? Uh, you know, obviously coming off that big injury. Um, a few weeks into fall camp, uh, what's the latest on Isaac Rex? How's he doing? Doing well. Yeah, he's playing well. Looks like he never left. I mean, um, and that was a gruesome injury. And uh, I'll be perfectly honest with you guys. I I was in the off season. I was prepared for us maybe not having him all year and was sort of of the mindset that we were probably going to be four to six games into the season before he would be 100%. Mm-hmm. And he looks like he's ready to go. I mean, he's, he's, wow. we're giving him one day a week off, but um, he looks good, and we're going to have him ready. That's BYU offensive coordinator Aaron Roderick. Spent some time with Matt Biamonte and I on Cougar Sports Saturday. You can check out that podcast feed on the KSL Sports app and all major podcasting platforms. So some of my observations from the scrimmage based on the footage that we were provided. It was limited. Three minutes of footage. Hey, you know, I I was thinking to myself, hey, if a legacy Cougar Club member can go, why not us? You know, my argument to to access, and look, I'm, I'm grateful for the morsels that we do get. It's better than nothing. Not complaining, but I will say this. Okay. Last year, Arizona opened up everything, had every practice open to the fans, to the media. And then in week one, BYU kind of struggled with Arizona, who ended up being a one win team. And BYU cited there was so much newness, they didn't, they had to adjust on the fly. You could have sent a spy into the stadium. So I'm just saying, do you really get an upper hand by this whole secrecy bit? Eh, I don't think so, per se. Maybe you do. We'll see. Uh, One thing that's not a secret, though, real quick, South Florida, they're going to start Gary Bohannon. No surprise there. As I said last week, that was going to happen. The fact that Timmy McClain, he wasn't given a fair shot to be quite honest with you. I thought the competition bit was kind of pointless. And reportedly, Timmy McClain, according to reports, Timmy McClain is headed for the transfer portal. So, hey, BYU, maybe dip into the portal and get Timmy McClain? That wouldn't be a bad idea. I'm just saying. Go get McClain, have him sit out this year, learn. I think that's a move to, for BYU and Aaron Roderick to consider. I would take that in a heartbeat. Timmy McClay next year in the Big 12? I can get on board with that. Again, some observations from the scrimmage. Peyton Wilgar, great athlete. How he got up in some of those passing lanes to deflect pass from Jaron Hall, I thought that was impressive. Hey, Keanu Hill made a nice grab against Caleb Hayes and Malik Moore in coverage. Those are the type of catches he's got to make. He wants to make himself the clear-cut wide receiver number three. Chris Brooks continues to look fantastic. He looks perfect in the bread-and-butter wide zone plays that BYU runs. I uh, saw Kingsley Suamata'ia at right tackle and Harris Lachance at right guard. Fisher Jackson with a pass deflection. I said coming into fall camp, he was going to be the guy, one of the guys that I thought took a big leap forward. I feel like he is. I think Fisher Jackson is a guy that's going to be a nice factor into this BYU defensive line this season. Hey, Terrence Fall, quietly showing some flashes. You know, I don't think Terrence Fall is going to surprise anyone and be a guy that's suddenly in the game day rotation at wide receiver. It's a deep room. 
but he's giving BYU some highlight catches. And that was something that was non-existent the previous two years. When you talk about trying to earn a roster spot into the Big 12 era, he's doing that. I think that's some positive signs for fall as he progresses into the future when BYU goes into the Big 12 conference. Speaking of young guys, uh, Chase Roberts, he had a nice grab against Gabe Judy Lally. Miles Davis up the middle. He's looking good. And, and Aaron Roddick, you heard him in that interview. Uh, Miles Davis is a guy that continues to make plays. Uh, some nice get off, too, from Logan Latui, the Weber State defensive end transfer. Kind of impressed by that. You know, he's a project, very undersized. He's only about like 230. He's very thin. But hey, he could be someone that develops into something down the road. Still kind of short, too, 6'1, like a little bit taller at defensive end. But nonetheless, uh, nice get off there from Logan Latui. I uh, Conover looked good on some of his passes, one of them to Roberts, a little bit low, but. You're seeing the decision-making, the decisiveness, uh, quick decisions, accurate throws. That's what you got to get from Conover. Because if Jared Hall goes down, you just want him to step in and be decisive. If you need to be a game manager, that's fine. That's okay. That's a great skill to have. And BYU can win a lot of ball games with a game manager. That is not a bad thing. And if he needs to be that this year, and then he evolves into more of a playmaker down the road, so be it. A good action, too, from Josh Singh. Josh Singh, Orem defensive lineman, a walk-on. He's someone that is a weight room warrior, a guy that pushes a lot of weight, showing well. You know, I tweeted about him during the Idaho State game last year that he's going to be a player that's intriguing to watch. Look, I'm telling you, he, he I've heard some good things about him last year in scout team. He is a name to watch down the road. Uh, you don't ever, it's hard to project what the, the ceiling is for a defensive lineman or any sort of walk-on for that matter, because the opportunities are tough to come by. You got to have a lot of things break your way for a walk-on to be a starter or be a significant contributor. And you have to be above and beyond outstanding, but maybe a nice rotational guy. If he could turn into that down the road at a P five team, that's great value. If you can get something like that out of Josh Singh, who showed quite well, Hinkley Ropati had a nice run. Tanner Walt. Another walk-on with uh, a touchdown grab. Good play from, from Tanner Wall. Ethan Erickson, you heard from Aaron Roderick. He could be someone that's a factor down the road. And then Josh Singh, uh, again, had a, an opposing uh, tackle for loss against BYU's offense. So there you go. That's the scrimmage from the uh, first one of fall camp. Week three practices start today. We'll be back down at practice. The media will on Tuesday, so stay tuned for that. We'll have a post-practice recap on here on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, all that. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, before we close out the show, Zach Wilson news. Man, that was a bummer seeing him go down with an injury and dealing with that. But he's expected to get, undergo surgery to repair a damaged meniscus coming up tomorrow. He's in Los Angeles to get that done as he suffered a knee injury on a scramble in the Jets preseason opener on August 12th. Zach, you got to get out of bounds, man. You cannot force the issue and go for those extra yards. It cost him dearly as he suffers that injury, but maybe he could be available for week one. It's a tricky spot for Zach because if he's out for an extended period of time, he's in a situation where, you know, Joe Flacco would step in and he's not going to steal Zach Wilson's thunder because he's, he's older, but say Joe Flacco struggles, maybe. Then Mike White steps in, and let's say Mike White has a little bit of success like he did last year. That vocal minority of people that say, hey, play Mike White, might grow. Because Robert Sull is in a spot where he's got to win ball games. Period. End of discussion. And so, Zach is in a delicate spot where you don't want to rush it, but at the same time, you got to get back in that quarterback one saddle because if you open the door for any sort of young quarterback to come in or have success, or even Flacco has success, because if Flacco's having success, you ride the hot hand because you're the Jets. Any sort of success would be, you got to keep riding it. You can't turn back to Zach, who's unproven still. So it's, it's a tough spot for him to be in, and hopefully he can get back in short order, be ready for week one would be amazing, uh, because after that that game, it felt doom and gloom. It felt like, oh man, his season's going to be done and wasn't as bad 
as initially expected. But that's going to do it for this edition of the Cougar Tracks podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to the show on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Leave a rating and a review. It helps out the show a ton. I'll be back tomorrow with a post-practice recap. You can also check out my Cougar Tracks updates on KSL News Radio at 5.55 a.m., 7.55, 3.55 p.m., and 5.55 p.m. I'll be on KSL News Radio this afternoon to talk about the AP Top 25 poll and the KSL Sports Zone. So, busy day for me all over the radio airwaves, and you'll check out this podcast again coming up on Wednesday at high noon. It's the Cougar Tracks podcast powered by KSLSports.com. Thank you.